This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference, or MC12, finally takes place in Geneva, Switzerland. The Ministerial Conference is WTO's highest decision-making body. WTO Director General Ngozi Onkonjo Iwila said this would be no ordinary meeting, and apparently she has a point, not least in alluding to a whole range of challenges facing the multilateral trade system, from the pandemic, politicization of trade, and worsening geopolitical rivalries in Europe and across the Asia Pacific. So what was achieved at the WTO conference? And what are the major takeaways? To discuss all this, I'm joined in Washington, DC by Sura Gupta, Senior Asia Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China American Studies. And here in Beijing, China by Dr. Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics. Welcome back to the Hub, gentlemen. It's so good to have you with us. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Gupta, if I may. We saw a rising number of regional trading regimes like RCEP and a lot of multilateral trade systems driven by geopolitics like IPAF, uh, recently announced by Joe Biden. What do you think will be the added value of convening a WTO meeting at this point? I mean, in what ways can it really help stabilize global trade? We have to think of this first and foremost, theoretically, even though that is not the fashionable way to think through it, multilateral liberalization is always the best and the sought after way of liberalizing. It is the fairest. If multilateral liberalization cannot go through, then you would like to have that within large plurilateral arrangements, which are open to everybody and are not exclusive arrangements, that they are open-ended arrangements, which are living agreements. But that said, uh, we should still aspire at this stage to ensure that the rules-based multilateral trading system can be given strength and muscle at a difficult time in international economic relations so that even it can get through this phase and once again renew itself. But I think, uh, but yeah, we are correct. The challenges are very, very tall. And at this point, it's just about taking the discussion forward and not stumbling and falling, or falling on the side. Professor Liu, Mr. Gupta talked about the fact that multilateral trading systems need to be given strength and muscle. Do you think this will happen? I mean, what do you think has come out of the WTO meeting? In today's uh, more and more interdependent world, and there has to be a multilateral platform for uh, uh, member countries really to uh, join together to discuss the most paramount issues, but now uh, WTO since 2017 has been there, uh, you know, uh, suffering from a standstill or impasse, and uh, therefore uh, it is now uh, not really uh, functioning to what has been expected. There has been uh, rising uh, the uh, proposition to reform, but uh, different countries and different members have very different agendas. So therefore, uh, it is really the high time given the new realities we are facing, the, the need for global recovery through uh, trade and investment, and uh, particularly to support those vulnerable countries. And so all this really are there to push the ministers to come up quickly with agenda to reactivate and or recalibrate uh, the functioning of WTO. And this is a very important, uh, and this really points to the uh, you know, the life of uh, all the uh, countries, how we can really, uh, you know, work together uh, in a more consensual way and in a more acceptable way towards the future. So, Mr. Gupta, I want to ask you about this specific proposal uh, that is a comprehensive intellectual property waiver on vaccines. That proposal was led by India and South Africa and was uh, co-sponsored by 65 members and supported by 100 others. Just to remind our audience about the urgency of the situation, only 17% of the population in low-income countries have received their first dose of COVID vaccine. However, the proposal met with fierce competition, both from the developed countries and big pharmaceutical companies. So Mr. Gupta, with low- and middle-income countries uh, ever obtaining a waiver to produce their own generic COVID vaccines and treatments through WTO? 
Uh, yes, I think they will get the exceptions that are there within within the WTO text and will be able to have their own vaccines. Uh, at this point of time, the consensus is there for that. The last stumbling block was that the United States uh, opposed this or was opposing this simply because, yes, China was on board saying that, you know, we are not going to we are, we are not a, going to be a beneficiary of this, and we have our own COVID vaccines, and we are in mRNA testing, et cetera, et cetera. But the United States wanted this to be factored into the text because, uh, and, 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 and this was understandably something China very adamantly disagreed with, because this will set a precedent that there is a China precedent for exclusive uh, uh, subtractions or additions in the text going forward in international trade agreements because of this precedent. So it's for the United States to withdraw that. And I think that will that was on, that, that is on the cards uh, simply because it's a very obstructionist move at a time when, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people suffering. And as you rightly said, there's so few people who have been vaccinated, frankly. Professor Liu, you researched and studied a whole lot about the issue of intellectual property. What do you think about this issue? Well, uh, because the principle of WTO is really equity and fairness, uh, and so that uh, every uh, member country really could access to the benefit of global trade, now under the uh, current situation without access from uh, those you know less developed countries because, you know, the... Uh, Two thirds of WTO members are uh, less developed countries. So, therefore, how to really tackle the uh, monopoly of uh, technology and uh, superiority of those uh, developed world is one very important task uh, to support the uh, lesser developed economies. It is within the regime and legitimate right of the WTO to really to set up rules to make sure that uh, you know the uh, technologies can be open source but uh, the active implementation is really uh, something at stake because you know company, uh, companies who are really making that will uh, be uh, resist uh, reluctant to do that and also the uh, the capacity restraint from the uh, lesser developed economies also uh, have a challenge to really, put that into real reality. Yeah, Professor Liu, I want to ask you about China. The Ministerial Conference of WTO focused on pandemic response, fishery subsidies, uh, agricultural reforms, among other things. What do you think is at stake for China? And after the four-day meeting, did the Chinese delegation achieve anything substantial? Well, uh, China has uh, a very firm stance, uh, uh, number one, to uh, enhance the operational capacity of WTO because such standstill was piles of uh, pending cases unresolved and that's really there to impede the uh, existence and uh, legal rights of uh, uh, the existence of WTO and legal rights of all members. And, uh, and then China also insisted the uh, special and differential treatment uh, for those uh, uh, lesser developed countries. And there has been a lot of disputes over this one because uh, most of the uh, uh, developing world uh, by definition is really self-declared or self-designated. So therefore, uh, this is really the main, uh, main bone of contention because the United States is really taking the lead to revoke the special and differential treatment for uh, at least the G20 countries in which China is a member. And uh, then uh, China is not really there to protect the interest of, uh, of its own, but also pro uh, protecting the uh, less developed economies as a whole. Yeah, there's a whole lot that, that needs to be overhauled and changed. Uh, Mr. Gupta, our lengthy negotiations and endless disputes have plagued uh, the WTO for ages. And that's why everyone is now talking about the WTO reform. But, you know, the word, the concept reform certainly means different things to different parties, right? What developing countries mean by reform is certainly different from the ideas being pushed by some developed countries uh, under the guise of reform. So did the MC12 send a positive signal? What are the major areas do you think that need reforming? 
Uh, no, I don't think it sent a positive signal on reform because most of the endeavors still was small ball endeavors, and this small ball endeavors is not going to lead to a transformational reform of the WTO, and it needs to be of a transformational nature. Let me make two points out here. Uh, and the first one is a little bit philosophical. You know, we've heard about the Kindleberger trap where we had the existing hegemon or the existing superpower underwriting the system. And the United States, uh, and Mr. When, when the Kindleberger trap was put out, it was with regard to the transitional phase when Britain was unable to cope, uh, carry the burden of uh, underwriting the international system, and the US was not ready to do so. And we are facing that sort of situation today where the United States is rejecting uh, bearing the burdens of the international system, which it had underwritten since the Second World War. And, and, the, and China and the developing world is not yet ready to step up to the plate out here. The second point I will make out here is that it is in China's interest now to step up in a big way. I'm not talking just purely in terms of MC12, but in terms of broader WTO functioning. And the reason for this is, is, is this. Uh, China became a trade superpower following its accession to the WTO in, 20, in 2001. China is now a trade superpower. China now needs to become a trade and investment superpower also in the international system. To become an investment superpower, we need rules, detailed rules on investment and industrial subsidies, et cetera, and industrial policy within the WTO so that disciplines and actions are constrained by rules and, 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 and embedded in rules. And it is in China's interest because China is going to become a gargantuan trade and, and investment superpower and these rules will anchor not just China, but the international order. And since the US is not willing to step up and not ready to step up, I think the time has come for China to show that it can do these, do these reforms, including in terms of global rulemaking at the WTO. Mm, right. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And finally, uh, uh, one last question to both of you, gentlemen. Given the uncertainties and challenges worldwide, do you think the WTO as it is is still an ideal platform for trade liberalization and dispute resolution. Is the proposed WTO reform just a band-aid approach? Uh, let me start with you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, at this point of time, yes, it's a band-aid approach. It's, 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 it's small areas. How do we sort out on the appellate body? Mind you, the appellate body is very, very important. It was the crown jewel of multilateralism, which was pulled down by the US. Yes, there are issues which need to be discussed on special and differential treatment. Yes, issues to be discussed on transfer, transparency and notifications. But fundamentally, uh, WTO is about rulemaking related to liberalization. At this point of time, WTO cannot do so, but large plurilateral agreements is, provide a good framework. Remember, the US is, is caught up in economic nationalism and stepping away from trade and, and liberalism, but that's not with the rest of the world. The EU and Japan signed an FTA, an economic cooperation agreement. We've had the CPTPP, we have RCEP, we have countries adhering to the comprehensive economic, uh, the, the CPTPP. In addition, China and the EU have their comprehensive agreement on investment. That is at this point of time in, in deep freeze, but China made very significant industrial subsidies commitments on that. So everybody is actually liberalizing. And if we can, for, if we can take that momentum forward, even if the WTO is currently in a state of suspended animation, trade liberalization at the multilateral and regional level can still move forward. Yeah, Professor Liu, what do you think? Well, uh, the wave of globalization that really uh, benefit all members of uh, the uh, of the world uh, will not really receive uh, uh, retreat because uh, there is a critical need uh, for the deliverable labor and specialization, also the entrenchment of uh, global supply chain to benefit all. Uh, uh, consumers and businesses, et cetera. But uh, now it is really uh, diverging into uh, different forms. So the uh, a blanket, the agreement uh, and platform like the PO cannot really be replaced by the uh, regional agreements. And so I would say that uh, 
uh, if uh, WTO is a blanket and the uh, regional agreement is really a uh, you know bandage. So uh, therefore, uh, this really uh, there to uh, help WTO to rethink the uh, position to uh, build more consensus driven uh, agreements to solve the new realities we are facing. Uh, it is really uh, the right time for all uh, responsible members to come up to defend such sort of platform so that it's functioning and it can really proliferate into uh, the domestic uh, rulemaking process into the regional uh, treaty making process, but to, de de uh, to really substitute or deplace WTO is an unwise one is going to impede the benefit mm -hmm. of all members. So therefore, uh, you know, China has made its very clear stance that we want to defend WTO and we want it to improve, uh, not only for the benefit of China, but also for benefit of all members. All right, thank you so much for your insights, Dr. Liu and Mr. Gupta. Always good to have both of you on our show. It's great, come back again soon.